Hey everyone, Giordano here from The Juice Media. Just a quick message to explain what this video is about. As some of you might know, we launched a podcast, The Juice Media Podcast, which is a companion to the Honest Government Ad series. The Honest Government Ads are really effective at getting people's attention and raising awareness about certain topics. But the podcast allows us to get into more depth onto the topic. We've done eight episodes and so far I've been uploading the podcast to our host. But I've realized that that's kind of not really the ideal way of doing it because here we have an audience of 300,000 subscribers, a similar amount on other platforms, and it seems silly to spend all this time creating these podcasts which are really full of information, like they're really, really valuable, and stick them up on a platform on our podcast host where you know not many people will, will know about it or see it. So, We'll still do that. We'll still upload the podcast onto our host. So if you're subscribed to our podcast, that's fine. You'll still see it in your feed. But we're also going to start uploading the podcast here to YouTube so that uh, everyone can access it more easily without having to go somewhere else. The reason I'm doing this really is that I feel like the information that we have in the podcast is really important. We can't fit it into the Honest Government ads, which are short and punchy. So yeah. Um, I really recommend uh, checking out the podcast if you want to know more about the topics that we discuss. After every Honest Government ad, I'm going to be uploading a new podcast. Um, it's going to be an audio-only thing, so you'll just see the little waveform. That's what we're doing for now, but um, as we go along, if people are into it and the podcast gets uh, enough audience, we'll start doing a video podcast like you've seen on some of the other channels on YouTube. Anyway, I'm not going to waffle on much more. I just wanted to do a little intro just to explain what this video is. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to now kick into the podcast, our latest one, which is episode eight, uh, which is the companion to our Honest Government ad about the fires. Thanks for watching the Honest Government ads. Thanks for your support, patrons, and everyone who contributes in other ways. We'll see you soon for our next video. Enjoy this podcast. Take care. Hey everyone, Giordano here from The Juice Media. Welcome to episode 8 of The Juice Media Podcast. This is a companion to our latest Honest Government ad about the fires. Hello, I'm from the Australian Government. Welcome to the Anthropocene. Fires, floods, bullshit. I'm splitting this podcast into two episodes because there's just so much to say on this topic, which is the topic of the climate emergency. The other reason I'm dividing it into two sections is that I have two amazing guests. And rather than rush them and try and squeeze them into one episode, I thought we'd dedicate one podcast to each of them so we can get into more depth. In the next episode, I'm going to be interviewing renowned climate scientist Michael E. Mann, who is the director of the Earth System Science Center at the Pennsylvania State University and is is currently here in Australia on sabbatical. So yeah, we're going to be speaking to one of the world's leading experts on climate shitfuckery. But in this episode, we're going to be talking about some of the solutions that are available to us right now to get ourselves out of this shit show. Mainly technological and economic solutions. I want to make that clear because there are also other solutions from a perspective of indigenous knowledge. We're not covering those in this podcast. But nevertheless, really, this is if for anyone who's wondering, like, what is the state of renewables? How realistic is it that we can make a shift to a zero emissions economy and society before it's too late? This podcast is going to be really interesting for you. And who better to take us through and help us understand the lay of the land than our guest today, which is Simon Holmes Accord. Simon is a whole bunch of things. He's described as an energy transition specialist. He's an entrepreneur. He's a senior advisor to the Energy Transition Hub at the University of Melbourne. He's been a pioneering force in the Australian community's power movement as the founding chair of Hepburn Wind, the country's first community-owned wind farm, which basically powers the whole town of Dalesford in central Victoria. But apart from all that, he's also super active on Twitter where he's constantly slaying trolls and helping to decode the never-ending stream of bullshit that comes out of our government related to climate policy, energy, renewables, and all that. So welcome so much to the podcast, Simon. Um, please, can you give us a sense of what, where are we at after the fires? Yeah, well, since since Christmas, and I guess the lead up to Christmas, the, the interest in this area has just skyrocketed. The amount of engagement I've had online I mean, I, I leave leave this leave the satire to you guys, um, but the, the the response to your last video I think has been phenomenal. Uh, but I've I've found such a receptive audience uh, out there, people really wanting to know more. I think we're both um, keying into into something um, in, in common, quite powerful. That I think pretty much everyone knows we're being lied to, but they don't quite know how. 
uh, the, the levels of trust in in the communication from uh, from government and those who are frustrating on climate action. The levels of misinformation are um, it, it's really high and it's and it's pretty transparent to everyone. Uh, but not everyone knows how they're being lied to. And you know, I spend a lot of time fact-checking, um, putting, putting new facts out there or, or you know, facts that people hadn't, haven't yet joined the dots, helping people join the dots on things. And the, the interest in that over the last uh, couple of months has, has been, um, for me to use that word, uh, that we're hearing a lot right now, it's, it's been unprecedented. I've been following your Twitter since we were we made a, an honest government ad about the renewable energy. It was in um, 2018. And um, I came across your Twitter page and it was just a, a mine of information. And, um, you know, it, it really helped me to get a lot of uh, facts and stats that you've been digging out and bringing out into the public arena. And um, since then, your Twitter profile has grown and you've made a lot more friends and probably a lot more enemies along the way. Um, but can you talk a little bit about that? Because I feel like there's a whole new job description out there that's been created, which is the communicator. We have climate scientists and we have engineers, but there's a gap between those people and the general public. Like climate scientists and engineers speak a language that the general public doesn't understand fully. There's a level of illiteracy, which is completely natural. But then now uh, this role of communicators as intermediaries to basically take the science, take the, take the complex stuff about climate science, emissions, renewables, um, and put them in terms that people can understand. And I see you as one of those communicators that has come out. Is that kind of how you see your role? Or what is, how do you see your role no, in, I think, in all I, of this? I, I think you've now that one thing that really sticks out to me, uh, in Australia, people talk about the energy debate. And there, there is... A, a, you know, acknowledge there there is an energy debate that we see play out in the media uh, and we see it play out in Canberra. Every week there'll be one or two long-form interviews on ABC with a politician talking about uh, about energy policy. Uh, there'll be front pages. It's been going on for, for most of the last decade. And almost every one of those is absolute bullshit. Uh, you, the um, uh, very few commentators understand the topic material and pretty much no politicians um, you know with, with, with the exception of a v very few but certainly not the ones that you hear on the radio understand uh, how the energy system works uh, and you would think that there is a great debate about whether or not we're going to go renewables in Australia or you know whether we're not we're going to decarbonize the facts on the ground are really different we we um you know, it's it's not a matter now of if we're going to transition or when we 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 have been transitioning uh, the the energy sector, the electricity sector, uh, for uh, nearly twenty years now, and it's been accelerating. Uh, we're making good progress. Uh, where if if the acceleration were to continue, we'd be making great progress. What's going on on the ground is very different from what you hear in Canberra. Um, so communicating that to people, explaining to them how the energy transition is going, what's likely to turn out why decisions are being made by industry and really in a lot of ways why uh, why the government is not in the steering you know they're, they're not in the driver's seat uh, on this they certainly uh, have done many things in the past to frustrate the development many things there are many roadblocks that industry is trying to work through that government is well placed to remove but really the energy transition is being driven by economics uh, and technical advances uh, and um, it's not it's not something that it will be decided by the outcome of some debate in Parliament or on the front pages of the newspapers. Well, that's really reassuring to hear that the economy is driving the transition. But then you wonder why the fuck aren't we the world leaders in renewable energy? And of course, that's because our government has been putting the brakes and slowing down that transition. And there's a long, sor sorry history of shitfuckery. And I was wondering, perhaps you could give us a bit of an overview of that history of shitfuckery and where we are in renewables now and where we could be. Someone explained to me recently that that investors run run from uncertainty. Uh, so in, during, the, during the last couple of decades, we had the renewable energy target in Australia, which set a very clear signal to investors on where mm. the country was going. Um, so it was to, to lift renewables in Australia from 8 to 20 percent uh, in um, by by 2020. We, and whose policy was that? That was the ironically, it was uh, John Howard introduced in 2001 the the mandatory renewable energy target. Right. The aim of which was to lift renewables in Australia from 8 percent to 10 percent. So a very small increment. Uh, and it was at a time when the energy system was expanding very quickly. Uh, so it wasn't seen as much of a threat at all. Um, they would, the pie was growing larger and they were going to give a little bit more 
to renewables. So it wasn't seen as really being uh, in competition and it wasn't a great threat to the coal industry. Around uh, the end of the 2000s, our growth in energy started slowing down significantly and uh, there was a lot of concern with the millennial drought that um, helped bring Kevin Rudd uh, in, into power. And Labor ran on the policy to lift it from the 10% to, to 20% target and there was strong bipartisan support for this. Around 2013, it, it, appeared, it, it became apparent that we were going to hit that target really early and we were actually on track to hit 28% by 2020. So um, Tony Abbott uh, commissioned a review to try to kill the target um, and, and try, to, try to stop it in its tracks. Uh, unfortunately for him, the, the review found that, uh, that renewables were the best way of bringing prices down, that under the, the, best, the best outcome for consumers was to, uh, to, leave, you know, to leave the target in place. He picked a middle position. They cut the target back. So we would we would have a bigger industry, a bigger a, a bigger renewables industry right now if it hadn't been for the very significant slashing back of the target in 2015. Right. So we're now uh, at about 22% uh, renewable in Australia and on track within a couple two to three years to be at 33%. So we're going to make about as much progress in the next three years as we made in the last right. 13. Alongside the renewable energy target, there was also the emission trading scheme that uh, that Labor brought in under Gillard. Just correct me if I'm saying something wrong. Yeah. Um, and you tweeted something about if that had been in place right now, farmers would be reaping billions in, in profits from uh, the emission trading scheme. I think I've just paraphrased you, but just that was very a really... Briefly, the part of the clean energy future package of, of the Gillard government was was the the carbon price which were emissions trading scheme with a th- which, which had a three-year fixed price at the beginning which which was called by uh, ultimately by the media and by politicians a carbon tax it wasn't a carbon tax it was an emission trading scheme and it was set up to transition uh, to link to the European climate uh, carbon trading scheme such that Australians could uh, buy and sell credits uh, in, into the European market. Now at that stage it, it was thought that we would be buying credits from right. Europe um, that, that they were going to be cheaper in Europe than Australia and, and our big polluters would go, would, would go to Europe, buy credits there to extinguish their liabilities here. Interesting, as uh, as things have panned out, the the European credits have increased significantly in price to way more than what it would cost us to make credits in Australia. Now, to create credits in Australia, we, we can do that through tree planting, biosphere restoration, better burning regimes. There's all sorts of things we can do uh, to create high quality carbon credits, and we can do that cheaper than anyone in Europe can do it. So if the scheme had been left in place, our farmers would be in a position to be selling billion, literally billions of dollars worth of credits to Europe. So we, so ironically, that you know the nationals who fought really hard against the carbon price have uh, really cheated their constituency out of uh, out of the out of a very you know what could be a very lucrative export market for Australia. Oh, I listened as you did to the podcast that uh, uh, Senator Matt Canavan and Barnaby Joyce have launched. The Weatherboard and Iron. <laughs> Weatherboard and Iron. Um, and, uh, you know, they go on this kind of very idyllic exploration of how they're looking after working families and small business. And the best way to do that is to build the this, you know, more coal mines. And at one point, I nearly spat my coffee because uh, Canavan says, you know, it's so great that we've got the Sardani coal mine started because one day I'll take my son and I'll show him the Carmichael mine and I'll say, son, you know, I did that. And my feeling is that his son is going to want to punch him in the face uh, <laughs> because son, everything will be dead around him. Hopefully his son drags him to the barrier reef and says, yeah, yeah what was what was this, Dad? Barnaby Joyce, um, they make a really interesting point. He said, we've had this debate over and over about whether carbon, whether coal is profitable, whether coal mines are the best way to do it. And we've won that argument over and over since the 2010 election. We keep winning that argument was, Gee, um, was, and, was and the I, quote. And I'm not sure they, I mean, I'm not sure they are. You ask, uh, you ask any any expert on energy and, and everybody knows that coal is no longer the cheapest way of creating energy now one, one thing that a lot of people don't understand is that existing coal if you've got a if you've got a uh, a, a fully depreciated coal plant that you bought so an example uh, Vales Point up in New South Wales cost its owner a million dollars as part of uh, the Abbott government's 
uh, asset recycling program, gov- um, state governments were strongly encouraged to sell off their sell off their assets. So New South Wales privatised their whole electricity system, sold Vale's Point Power Station for one million dollars. Now that's an incredibly cheap asset that you, just, you know, feed a bit of coal into it, and out comes power. And if you don't have to pay more than whatever your cost of that million dollars was. I mean, less than, like, the power station costs less than the average Sydney home. Uh, <laughs> it's phenomenal, right? Um, now, if you wanted to build that station from scratch, it would cost you $3 billion. Uh, and if you pay $3 billion for the coal power station, you're never going to make any money out of it. If you pay $1 million, you can make, you know, you make bank, and, and they are. Um, ironically, we just heard this week that the government's about to give $11 million to that power station to extend its life. Uh, crazy times crazy times we live in but no the economic case uh old coal so sorry just to um highlight the points so it's not that coal is profitable it's some people are making money out of it because it's being propped up by government but otherwise it's completely we're, we're, we're constantly being lied lied to in in this debate you know there's, there's, there's a there's some concept that we that we need to build new coal uh power stations in australia when we when we go to the energy market operator and uh, ask them to tell us how the system is likely to develop um, and we do that every every couple of years. The energy market operator puts out a, a document called the Integrated System Plan. It's pretty technical. They work they work pretty hard to make it readable, and it's getting it's getting a lot better. But unless you're an energy geek, you're going to fall asleep. Um, mm. Uh, this is well, what we need to do. <laughs> well before the two three hundred pages that it is, and and the six hundred pages of appendices. But that document, it's, it's the most rigorous study ever done of the Australian energy system. And what it tells us is that the cheapest path forward is going to be going to be put more renewables in renewables and storage. Uh, I think there's a lot of confusion around the storage. We don't need as much as some people think we need, and we don't need new advances in technology. We, just, we it's we all there, ready to go. It's all ready to go, and that's that's quite a dangerous frame. We, we'll hear the government talking a lot more about technology over the next few weeks. They're about they're putting together a, a roadmap, uh, technology roadmap, setting up a frame that um, you know, climate action is good. But we need new technology to get there, and that technology hasn't been invented yet. So sit, sit, sit tight. Wait for us to wait. Yeah. Wait for us to deliver something. But no, we know we know that we have solutions right now uh, for about seventy percent of emissions. So we should be. Mm. Yeah, you know, we and we are starting. We, we have started. It's not whether we're going to push the go button. The question is how how fast we're going to do it. Mm. And the government is 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 not making any mm. meaningful progress mm. uh, on helping helping industry to do this. So in terms of being lied to and honestly being bullshitted, the government's uh, one of the probably the top uh, pick in this department is the government's claim that emissions are coming down, that we're going to meet and beat our targets. We hear that mantra repeated constantly. Is that what's the fact check on that? So in in the electricity sector, emissions are coming down. Renewable energy is pushing coal out of the system. We've had 13 coal power stations close since 2012 in Australia. And uh, we're not burning any more gas since then, uh, and renewables have increased. So renewables have helped us very much uh, reduce the emissions in the electricity sector. But electricity sector is only one third of the economy, and all the other sectors of the economy, pretty much, pretty much all of them, are going in the wrong direction and are negating what's happening there. So while it might be true to say emissions are coming down in one sector, in two thirds, the, re- the other two thirds of the economy, they're not. In fact, our emissions have been stagnant for the last, well, since, since, since we had a change of government. Our emissions have been stagnant and they are expected, the government's own numbers show that there will be no material change between now and 2030. So we're not reducing emissions and the government has no plan to do it. Now, as whether we'll meet our Paris targets, um, the government's own numbers that they released just before Christmas show that, no, we won't. We won't get the 26% reduction. We'll get more like a 12% reduction between now and 2030. Um, and the way they take it to the saying they hit the target is to use these Kyoto credits. All right. Sorry, who negotiated the Kyoto credits? Where did that Where did that bullshit come out of? Well, there's so the original Kyoto credits, the Kyoto Protocol was 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 negotiated back in 1997. Right. So it's ancient history. The Australian negotiators, I know someone who was there, uh, and, uh, and and she'll carry to the grave her guilt for, for what the Australian government made her do. Australia held those talks in Kyoto to ransom. We said we would only agree to the Kyoto Protocol if Australia was allowed to increase their emissions. 
So we, it, it, there's a special clause in the Kyoto Protocol, the, which people call the Australia clause, clause, where Australia's target was 108%. We were allowed to increase our right. emissions. Wow. Um, and just to add in, insult to injury, once the agreement was negotiated, we then refused to sign it. So, <laughs> so uh, it wasn't until 2007, Jeez. just after, that was one of Kevin Rudd's This is a things. definition of shitfuckery, right? That here, is shitfuckery, <laughs> that we said to people, we're not going to sign it. We, we will scuttle this international agreement unless we can increase our emissions. So we set a really high baseline for Australia. And then when we, uh, and, and that baseline was set based on a year when land clearing was out of control in Queensland. Um, and and that, that's a certain amount of shit fuckery there too. Right. We used that as our baseline, our right. worst possible year, and we negotiated 108% from it. Wow. And then we refused to sign the agreement. So when we came in slightly below that, we so claimed I'm, those. I'm always cr- thinking we need to make an honest government ad, like retrospective. We just, you know, we set it in 1999, yeah. and we make because that's you could make that, that needs the, to be the, understood the, the, exactly. This, this is this is some of the the, the biggest shit fuckery yeah. that Australia that Australia has done. Um, so, so the so the global kind of, you know, the global uh, community thought it was better that we were in the agreement than we were we were outside trying to tear it down. But we were one of the only countries not to sign the Kyoto Agreement. Um, and it wasn't until 2007 that we did. Now, when we did better than our worst year, we we were given credits. Right. Um, so those, you, know, you could you could say they're, you know, they're fake. They're, they're fake credits, right? It's not that we it's not that we did anything to earn them. What we did was negotiate really hard in 1997. That was our crowning climate achievement for this. You know, from 1997 to 2020, our crowning achievement uh, internationally was to negotiate a high target and then do nothing and sit back and earn the credits. Now, as far as using those credits in the Paris Agreement, there is no framework to do so. We, we In fact, that was one of the biggest sticking points in Madrid, the, the, the climate conference last December, where uh, the, the rules of the, of the Paris Agreement, the final, the market rules are still being negotiated. Australia was the only country saying, we want to use Kyoto credits, uh, and we're going. You know, we we intend to do less than other countries because we have all these credits from a previous scheme. But there's yeah no legal framework to do so, and certainly um, uh, you know there, there abs- you know, very strong opposition from a large number of countries for Australia to cheat. So, I mean, as a historian, because what you've just given us is a history of policy, uh, foreign policy in terms of uh, Australia's involvement in, in these climate talks, which will define really the, this, the century for humanity, um, but also the you know, sort of domestic policy with, you know, emission trading schemes and those sort of things. And, um, you know, as a historian, I just, you know, I just feel like this is why I said we need to go back and make a video about this, is that if you don't understand the, the role that Australia has played in the past in terms of setting up these, uh, this very unfair um, uh, immoral, basically, um, game. You don't understand why now claiming these credits uh, now is kind of like you could say, look, yes, we were there was shit fucker in the past, but now we're clean. Now we're going to do it. But the fact that we're claiming those credits is basically repeating that, uh, and we're that trying to claim those credits. Like, there's no agreement whatsoever to do so. And at the Madrid conference, at, at the end of every day, the all the NGOs get together and have an award ceremony, fossil of the day. They award um, right. uh, they they award a, a fossil to to the country that has done the most during that day to undermine progress, and Australia won won fossil a day five times, right. uh, which was more than any other country. Yeah, and that's not atypical at these things. Mm. I mean, and we saw it at the Pacific Forum. I mean, we we literally reduced people to tears. Uh, that is the frustration that this. Um, that our government, I mean, like, you know, we have to kind of, we can't always externalize it, kind of like they, them kind of thing. This is, this is who we voted in collectively. You know, it's, it's a collective shame, really, that, that everyone should, should feel um, and take to the next election. But on the point of this fossil award, I wanted to take us on to the next point, which is something else that you've written about, the mantra that often gets repeated, uh, that we only contribute 1.3% of global emissions. And therefore, I mean, this argument was really popularized very powerfully by Alan Jones with his bowl of rice um, sort of visual metaphor, which was obviously a very powerful um, image because it, it affected a lot of people. Um, and you've kind of unpacked that a little bit. Australia is responsible for 1.3% of 
current warming. That's not good. That's the bad news. We are responsible for 1.3%. The good news is we only are responsible for 1.3% of the solution. Like we don't have to carry the whole world on it. We've we've got we're responsible for a slice, and we can fix our slice. Now we're actually in a position where we're a wealthy country. We've we're great technology developers. Um, there's an opportunity for us to uh, play a much bigger role for that, and not notwithstanding um, all of the coal we, uh, that, that we export right now is, is increasing emissions in all sorts of other countries. So you could, if, if we took ownership for those, you could say we're, we're responsible for 4 to 5% of global emissions for coal and gas. We export where, where we could be exporting a whole lot of technology and uh, green hydrogen, green ammonia that could reduce emissions uh, around the world. What would that actually look like? Because when yeah. people talk about we could export renewable energy, I think a lot of people go, what, well, how do you export solar? Because everyone gets, like, people have no idea. What does that actually mean? Like, how do you, how do you export renewables? So there are three ways that we can export renewable energy. Um, there, um, the first one is that we can, we can export energy in goods. Um, we currently export a lot of energy in the form of, a, of, of aluminium ingots. Uh, aluminium, uh, some people have called in the past congealed energy. It takes an immense amount of energy uh, to to create aluminium, and it's one way that energy uh, is moved from parts of the world that have surplus energy to parts that that don't have enough. So um, there are other goods like zinc, and and to some extent steel is 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 an energy intensive good. So we can put our clean energy into those materials and and export them around the world. So transform goods, so value adding raw raw goods is one way. Um, another way is is cables, and now a little while ago uh, it seemed absolutely fanciful, but uh, th- there is a fascinating project at the moment um, that, that, that so it was just announced a couple of months ago, Sun Cable, uh, backed by Mike Cannon-Brooks and Twiggy Forrest. That's for powering Singapore? That's for, it, it'll create, I think, if I'm right, about 15% of the power that Singapore uses. Singapore well, with an underwater cable. Yeah, a cable, all, it'll be the world's largest, if it, when, if it were built now, it'd be the world's largest solar farm near, near Tennant Creek yeah. and the world's largest battery by a long way. Cable would go up to Darwin and then through Indonesian waters up to Singapore and provide about 15% of power in Singapore and, and um, do so for a lower cost than um, than doing the same trip with uh, with the LNG that you know compre- extracting the gas compressing it into liquid form sending it to Singapore decompressing it and running it through gas turbines they uh, they're confident that we can we can send it to Singapore on a subsea cable so that's one way we can we can export it but the third way is to create uh, is to create fuel or um, hyd- hydrogen based fuels that we can ship so whether that's liquid hydrogen or ammonia which is a very a much more convenient way of transmitting hydrogen or transporting hydrogen we can do that um, and 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 the, you know, the economics for that are, sh- are shoring up very very rapidly I was recently in in Germany and Japan talking about um, talking with people about hydrogen uh, I met a, a steel mill um, Thyssenkrupp's steel mill just um, in Duisburg in, in the in the Ruhr Valley about 15,000 people in uh, in a 20th century steel mill that's very coal dependent, um, they have made a commitment that within 30 years, uh, they, the, the whole company will be zero carbon um, and I think um, 30% reduction by 2030, which for a steel mill is a very challenging thing to do. It's one, one of the, um, the steel industry is responsible for about 7% of global emissions. Uh, it's one, thought to be one of the most difficult areas to decarbonize, but they have um, they have a project well underway. They did their first test just in, in November of using hydrogen in a blast furnace rather than coal. Uh, and they, they're, um, they're on track. They know exactly how, they, um, you know, what, what, how they're going to approach the problem. Uh, they're investing many, many millions into the pro- project. But they said to me, like, we know all this, but we just don't know where our hydrogen is mm-hmm. going to come from. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, I just put up a hand and said, that's, that's us. That's Australia's job. So, yeah. And Singapore, uh, sorry, in, in Japan, I was, I was there last month. And uh, the I met with a major Japanese shipping company, and they uh, they know that they've got to decarbonize their you know, they're committed to decarbonizing by 2050. Um, it's not like you know they're wondering whether to do it like you know the Australian conversation. They're absolutely committed to decarbonizing mm. shipping. How do you do it? Uh, well, hydrogen based fuel is is. Um, uh, is 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 one of one of their work streams of of, of doing this, and uh, an ammonia is probably the product they'll use for that. And again, they asked, "Where are we going to get the hydrogen from?" And we put our hands in Australia. We we are we are in a position to to create this ammonia, which we the the way that we will almost certainly do it. Um, 
and the, and the way they're interested in, you know, they, they don't want to buy hydrogen that comes from fossil fuels uh, that defeats the whole purpose. We will produce the hydrogen. Wind, wind and solar energy go into electrolyzers, which basically you stick a couple of wires in a in 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 in, in water. And in, in probably a lot of people do this in physics in school. Um, it's more sophisticated than that now. But with electricity in, and and water, we can make hydrogen, and and oxygen is a byproduct. Um, but the hydrogen, we can then mix that with nitrogen, which comes from the air, make ammonia, and we can ship that relatively easily. Uh, to to markets such as Japan and and Germany and other other industrial countries which which are you know, big on industry large populations. Ammonia is needed for ammonia. We can we can use ammonia. Um, uh, it's it's very flexible. We can extract the, the CSIRO have some great technology that will allow us to run it past a membrane and pull hydrogen off it. Um, we can also you, you can burn it a lot like a lot like a lot like diesel you can um uh it, it can be run into a modified diesel engine it can be put into a gas turbine without um, emissions or co2 emissions. without any co2 right some work has to be done to, to deal with the night um uh, nitrous oxides but that's that's all doable and they've got pathways to do that um but it's it's an incredibly flexible fuel it can be it can be we, we could turn our sunshine and our wind in australia into liquid um, and rather than exporting LNG, where you know, I guess just like uh, aluminium is congealed energy, uh, ammonia is congealed wind and solar. Earlier, you described yourself as an energy geek, and I can just see as you're talking about all this, you've got this glint in your <laughs> eye. That, like you can see that you've really sort of like. What's really exciting to me is that uh, is that we now have pathways mm. for so much. So th- there's. People often say, how, do, "How energy transition?" Like, I get the idea; we have to decarbonize, but how do we do it? Well, the two simplest things you need to know is electrify everything, and then use renewables for the electricity, right. um, and that gets us to seventy percent decarbonized. Um, there, cement and some other processes. I've been, been spending a lot of work, a lot, a lot of a lot of my research time on those other industries, steel and cement. And I visited the steel mill that's planning to go zero emissions. I visited a cement plant that's planning to go zero, zero emissions, and I and Five, ten years ago, people had no idea mm. how these were going to happen. Mm. But the introduction of the European uh, climate, uh, you know, climate policies have created a lot of innovation there. One, you know, a proud and sad moment is in, in I visited in Belgium a a cement works that's developed a technology to decarbonize cement, and cement's about three to five percent of global emissions. So it's a pretty pretty big. Uh, pretty significant and it's as as the world urbanizes there's a lot more construction that has to go on uh, and cement so cement will be around and probably increasing through this century so it's a it's a it's a big problem worth solving i visited a plant in belgium that's addressing this um the technology uh comes from australia the company uh, did the development in bacchus marsh just you know on the edge of melbourne uh, and they moved to europe to develop this based on a 12 million euro grant so mm. we we our, this great technology developed in Australia. That's less money, or just about the same amount of money that we're paying to AGL to for the um for the Vales Point plant, not AGL, yeah, but, but but um <laughs> yeah, different different plant. But yeah, we, we're we're spending more to help a coal plant yeah. extend its life than than developing than this, the technology the, that's going to save us. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned you wanted to say something else about the one point three. Is that? I mean, I. The one point, the, the argument that Australia should do nothing because we're a rounding error, right? That we're only 1.3%. Um, I, I see that you know, as, as, as both morally and intellectually bankrupt as an argument. And, and look, I, I, I'm not sure that anyone who uses that argument really believes it. I think they just think they've got a very clever, you know, rhetorical trick. People who say that are basically saying that one one point three percent is basically nothing. Uh, and so if we, why bother? Yeah. So why bother? I mean, of course, um, if if you were to stop paying paying taxes, uh, I'm guessing that you are less than one point three percent of Australia's tax base. Um, then then yeah, the argument is like, what would it matter if you stopped paying? And of course, you know, everybody knows. If if your if your five year old asked you, you're like, why should I stop doing this? Uh, everyone else is doing it. You would very quickly give them a moral, uh, you know, a, correction. a moral correction yeah. um, that that that's just not the way. That that's not our value. And you know, everyone knows when they go to vote that they are only one, you know, one small voice. Mm. We all know that we have civic duties to go forward. And a great example: World War One. Diggers made up about one percent of the British imperial forces. Uh, 
But we, you know, Australia has always been proud of what those diggers did. Um, and, and, and that we, we, we stepped up. We're not, an, we're not normally a nation of shirkers, or at least this is a relatively new, uh, a new thing for Australia. It certainly started in 1997, back at that Kyoto conference. We became a nation of shirkers when it came to climate policy. Mm. Yeah. And one, one thing to keep in mind, we are 1.3% of emissions, but we're only 0.3% of global population. So the average Australian is using about four times uh, the average citizen of the planet. Yeah. Um, in fact, among among major countries, we are the highest emi- emitting country. Our, our power system is dirtier than China's. Uh, China's. Um, we, we're responsible for about two to three times as much emissions as the average uh, Chinese, f- far more than the average Indian citizen. Um, so we, you know, among the worst, and also among the the most exposed countries That's to climate thing. change, That's right? It. So it's Where, like, what more do you want? Like, this is like the two such gr- good reasons to, to yeah. take action. If you're, if you are working in the, in the interests of Australians, you are going around the world doing, using every bit of soft power we have mm. to try to convince countries to, to do, to be more ambitious on climate change. The Paris Agreement, as it currently stands, is setting us on target for at least three degrees warming. Now we've mm. seen what one degree looks yep. like. Two degrees, we don't have a reef left. Three degrees, many of our uh, institutions, many of many things that the bedrock, many of our bedrocks of civilization, such as uh, food, clean food and water, and um, you know, being able to work outside and sport and all these things, they we, they fall apart well before three degrees. Mm. We're on that track with the Paris Agreement. We don't even know what three degrees is. Cause, we don't. Because be, it could be far worse than that. We don't know what the feedback cycles could be. Absolutely. But, that's, but, what, but that's kind of what we think at the moment that would look like. Absolutely. That's, that's something that a few climate scientists explained to me recently, that when, when the IPCC says three degrees warming, they have not yet included the, the climate feedbacks, um, the, the things that you know, where, where we, we pass tipping points where... So the, the the methane that's coming out of the tundra in in in, in the Arctic Circle, um, they're not that's not counted in. So mm. yeah, so it the IPCC estimates, um, their, their, their predictions, etc., are very conservative. The Paris Agreement, the whole structure is, look, let's agree to something, and then we'll ratchet it up. Yeah. So we're expected to increase our ambition this year, and then in a couple more years from now, increase it again, and gradually mm. everyone ratchets it up. Now Australia should be there, ratcheting every other country up as much as they can um, to protect us as the front line on climate change. But also the thing that I bang on about is is in a carbon constrained global economy, Australia wins. We are really well placed to, we have these boundless planes in our poetry. They're, they're windswept, they're sun drenched. We have the technology now. We don't have to develop world anymore. capital of sun porn, as we said in the- <laughs> The world capital of sun porn in it, yep. Uh, and, and we have relatively stable government. Um, uh, we have financial institutions that, that are well placed to grab um, the benefits of these resources and produce this liquid clean energy that gets shipped around the world that helps other countries decarbonize. Yeah, they're, they're, few countries you can imagine well as better placed as Australia. There's so much to talk about. We've talked about so much. And maybe, yeah. you know, the best thing really is to um, wrap it up and ask you to come back another time so we can talk about the other stuff because there is really so much to talk about. And I mean, this is one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot, you know, that climate, and I, that use, I use that as an umbrella for like, you know, renewables, uh, climate policy, so government policy and um, economy requires its own kind of spin off of the Honest Government Ad series. And I've been really kind of thinking lately of maybe creating a separate department that is like a department of climate shit fuckery that can really focus on these things so that we can help to um, counter the narrative. Because one of the things we haven't spoken about in this whole thing, and this is, you know, we can talk about this another time, but basically that there is a huge misinformation campaign going on um, from News Corp. We saw it in the in, uh, the Murdoch media really firing on all cylinders with um, with that in January during the fires um, with, you know, bullshit about arsonists and yeah. greens and backburns Fortun- and hazards. Fortunately, I think a lot of that didn't stick, right? I think, I think you know, most sane people realise that, no, you know, most, most sane people do recognise things, things have changed and I, I don't think that arsonist narrative really 
really ended up sticking. Because there was a really good response. I mean, the the fire chief responded, the police counted. I mean, it was great. People actually said, "Hang on, that's bullshit," you know, and that's kind of what needs to happen on a on a on yeah. a regular basis. And you know, I feel like in the middle of an emergency with all the fires, there was a real incentive to counter it, but otherwise it just goes unchecked, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. So, you know, and that's what what I really want to do um this year is to try and really check those lies as yeah. they come out. Not just from Murdoch, but from the government itself, and it's also, of course, what you do on Twitter. And well, you already do it, and it's interesting. Yeah. I think because because the 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 truth is really complex, right? And my, one thing I try to do it, you know, read these complex reports and syn- synthesize them to make to make it so that someone who's fairly engaged uh, can can understand it quickly. Um, and then at one level, you've I mean, the honest government ads uh, take these complex ideas and make them. Two orders of magnitude simpler yeah, again, even so more that, yeah, so they can accessible. fit into two minutes twenty. And it sounds like you're talking about the middle, which is like uh, you know, a bit more meat on you know, de- delving a little bit deeper. Um, might be a little bit more specialized interest, but helping mm. people understand, yeah, helping people navigate. And you've got you've got so much bullshit out there, and we've got to in, um, increase people's literacy about the the these arguments so that they can do this themselves eventually. Because there's no point constantly responding to the bullshit. Sure. Actually, the idea is let's help people become literate in the terminology in in the words. Then, when they see the bullshit, yeah. they can recognize it. They've got a better chance of recognizing it themselves because they understand. Yeah. That would be a, a, an amazing thing to take into the election, which is. But perhaps it's been it's two been years over, away. Yeah, perhaps it's been overcomplicated, though, right? What, what we know from you know from academia and everyone has looked at this thing that the solution is, as I said before, electrify everything, use renewables to do it. We have the technologies already uh, to do all that. Um, it's and it, it's already happening, and to a large extent, government needs to get out of the way, but create consistent rules and remove barriers in order to accelerate mm-hmm. this. Uh, remove barriers, or even having a level playing field would be wonderful. Like stop propping up. Yeah, these, it would be cra- these crazy. To uh, we've we've got to point the electricity system that. Uh, you know, we, we, as the coal plants disappear, they're replaced by renewables. So anything the government does to prop up coal, as they've, you know, it's it's been leaked that they're about to give money to the Vales Point Power Station to kick it on. It's abs- absolute crazy talk. Um, but that that uncertainty delays. that delays everything. But it also the investors go, screw this, we're out of here. We're yeah. going to a country that's that, serious like, about like this, the yeah. Australian cement company that I mentioned mm. that's gone to Europe. Because it's just you, know, you sit around here and, and listen to the radio or watch watch mm. the news or read the newspaper, and you see that our government is not is not yet committed to mm. de- decarbonisation. Mm. So just go somewhere where it is. Yeah. So actually, we need the government just to kind of get out of the way. As Barnaby said, I don't want the government in my yeah. life. You know, <laughs> great. Yes, yeah. we agree. Yeah. I mean, that's we we don't want the government to pick winners. Yeah. Uh, set set the guardrails. Say, you know, we 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 haven't talked about Zali's bill. But you know that that'd be my call to action is yep. um, you know, uh, the independent for Ringa has put forward a private members bill for uh, and it's it's very simple basically that we should adopt a zero emissions by 2050 target and have five year plans to get there. Now it's not it's not enough, but like the Paris Agreement, mm. it's a place to start and then ratchet up over time as we become comfortable. Mm-hmm. I think it's the best idea in Australian climate politics right now and it's really interesting it's com- coming from an independent so it is uh and, and, and zali was speaking at the climate emergency summit just passed about one way to get this through is for it to be adopted as a conscience vote um like we had on marriage equality um we, it, it seems like that both parties can't you know can't commit to this as parties but as individuals uh i think the moment has come where where certainly the public is on board and and the MPs ready to listen if they are freed from party politics and given a conscience vote. So please, my my plug, go to climateactnow.com.au and lend your voice. About 25,000 people have signed up already, but it's a very easy way to send a message to your MP telling them you want climate action now with a very simple, non-political policy response. Uh, And one of the best things is it's a model that has been introduced by conservatives in the UK and it works, so let's do it. What's the URL again? Climateactnow.com.au.
Okay, we'll put that in the show notes so people can find it. Um, and it's great because as Jean Hinchliffe, one of the student strike organizers, said at the Climate Summit, I was following the live stream, she said the reality is that politicians often don't lead, they follow. So, you know, if there is this kind of individual kind of push, um, it will encourage. And on that note, is that bill, does it have a chance of passing? What are the numbers looking like? Does Labor it- hasn't declared what they'll do on it, on it yet. If they scuttle it, then it's then it's dead. So, uh, please, if you're in a if you're in a Labor seat, yeah. let, let people write you know, to your MP. write to your MP, and that website gives you a way of doing so very easily. Right. You can you can do a form letter, or please take the time to put your own words in because they will mm. have a hundred times more more power. But get it in, and when people often ask me like, what's what's what can I do? Well, do that and get your friends to do that and tell your friends why and and you'll probably have more impact than uh you know th- th- than all the other consumer decisions you make this week we've got to get progress uh, at a federal level and uh this is this is one way of doing so well that's a great um place to end for today but um thanks so much simon for joining us and i've learned a lot and i could probably write a couple of honest government ads based on some of the things that, you, that you've just said so so thanks for that and thanks for all the work that you do on on twitter like and um, you know it's i know that you have fun you can tell that you enjoy doing it uh but it's also such a great uh service that you provide you know and uh, it's great to see that and on that note is there anyone on in the energy of poll Twitter that you want to kind of like that you find also um, really helpful to you and that you think um, would be good for people to follow. I get a lot from uh, Katan Joshi. Um, a lot of people he's been communicating on this for more than a decade. That K E T A N J zero. Mm-hmm. Um, he's great. Uh, yeah, he's, he's fantastic. Um, Again, he's just got a real knack for communicating things in an engaging way. Sometimes funny, a little bit of humor, but it's just really clear and just really easy to follow. And yeah, yeah, I, I see him as a, as a uh, you know as, as a next generation Dr. Mm. Carl. Yeah, uh, he 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 knows how to get complex science mm. ideas and and simplify them down. So uh, he's great. And on climate policy and climate accounting uh, issues, I follow Tim Baxter. That's uh, and he's Tim in Mitcham. And uh, yeah, he works for the Climate Council and I've learned a lot from him over the years, Any, anything technical. Um, my co-worker at Melbourne University, Dylan McConnell, Dylan J. McConnell is his Twitter handle, and uh, he posts really interesting insights. He really you know, understands the electricity market so much and I've learned so much from him uh, over, over the three years I've been working with him. And lastly, Frank Yotso at the ANU. Um, Frank Frank's with the Crawford School of Government up there and, and a, a very great communicator. I've learned a lot from Frank too. Frank Yotzo, J-O-T-Z-O. Awesome. Well, there are some great recommendations. And of course, Simon's handle on Twitter, if you aren't already following him. Simon A-H-A-C. Simon A-H-A-C. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Simon. Um, and yeah, we'll be back soon with uh, another Honest Government ad. So thanks for tuning in. Good, uh, good luck editing that into something short yeah. and cogent. Well, I don't know if I'm going to bother editing that much <laughs> because uh, it's just so relevant. And I feel like for people that are into well, I'll cut it here and there. But I think um, I'll keep most of it because it's just also it's just a lot of work editing. And I'm like, fuck it, let's just <laughs> put it there, you know. Um, awesome. Go Thanks so it. much. Simon. Take care. Thanks. <laughs> See ya. And that brings us to the end of this episode of the Juice Media Podcast. I did end up editing it quite a bit because we had a massive conversation, but I didn't. I wanted to keep um, a, a lot of it because uh, it's so important and the detail really matters. A reminder that this is just the first half of our podcast relating to the Honest Government ad on the fires, so stay tuned because our next episode dropping really soon is going to feature a conversation with distinguished professor Michael E. Mann, one of the world's leading climate scientists and therefore expert on climate policy shitfuckery. If you enjoyed the podcast, please, the best thing you can do is uh, recommend it to your friends and family and pets. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not really promoting it. It's really word of mouth. So if you liked it, if you value the, the podcast, um, yeah, recommend it. As always, a reminder that all of this, the Honest Government ads, the podcast, uh, the fact that I can have time to do this is made possible by our patrons. If you're not a patron and you love the work that we do, head to patreon.com forward slash the juice media and sign up. Otherwise, that's all from me. You've been listening to Giordano on the Juice Media podcast. We'll be back really soon with part two of this podcast and with another Honest Government ad. Until then, take care.